Thanks very much indeed. And could I start by congratulating the conference organizers. I think this is one of the world's great forums. It's more down to earth than Davos, and it's much less regimented than BOW. So good on India, and well done. The first thing I want to do is to stress the benefits of freer trade. Between 1990 and the start of the pandemic, the percentage of the world's population living in absolute poverty dropped from over 30% to under 10%. The percentage of the world's population that lacked access to safe drinking water dropped from over 30% to under 10%. More wealth was created in that 30-year period than in the previous 30,000 years. These were the best times in human history, and they owed a great deal to freer trade in a globalized world. Now, I like to think that as Prime Minister, I did my own bit to cultivate that. On my watch, Australia finalized free trade deals with our three biggest partners, with China, with Japan and with South Korea. And the deal we did with China was China's first with a G20 economy. More recently, as a special trade envoy, uh, I helped with the India-Australian ECTA, the Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, India's first deal in a decade, its best ever deal, and a deal which will mean that 90% of Australian exports to India enter tariff and quota free, and 100% of India's exports to Australia enter tariff and quota free. But there is a downside as well as a huge upside to freer trade. Freer trade makes everyone richer, but if it really is freer, it also makes countries more equal. It makes all countries richer, but it makes poorer countries richer faster. And because of its emergence from Maoist isolation into the world economy, over the past 30 years or so, half a billion Chinese have moved from the third world to the middle class. A wonderful development. In some ways, the greatest advance in human well-being in all history. In the process, China has become an economic superpower. And it's also now becoming a military one too. In the process, Western countries acquired super cheap consumer goods. We also severely hollowed out our manufacturing base. So, of course, there is a strategic dimension to trade. When President Obama, back in 2011, announced what he called America's tilt to the Indo-Pacific, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was the economic component of that strategic shift. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was supposed to build trade and build trust between like-minded countries. And at about the same time as President Obama uh, announced the Trans-Pacific Partnership, China announced its RCEP, or Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and that was aimed at locking regional economies into uh, a web dominated by China. Now, it's a real pity that US domestic politics scuttled the United States participation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And if I may say so, it's to the great credit of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe that the TPP was in fact resuscitated without the United States. And it would be to everyone's advantage today if the United States joined the TP, 
TPP. It would also be to everyone's advantage if Taiwan was admitted and indeed also the United Kingdom, which would give the TPP uh, a global reach. On the other hand, um, understanding China's ploy, it's good that under Narendra Modi, India pulled out of the regional comprehensive economic partnership at the 11th hour. So yes, there is a strategic dimension to trade, uh, and as the world becomes more polarised, the strategic dimension to trade is going to get even more important. I want to make two final points. One reason why previous Australian governments failed to conclude trade deals that they said they desperately wanted was because they wanted those trade deals to be about everything about labour standards, about product standards, about environmental standards, as opposed to simply about an economic partnership. So if we want to do trade deals, please, let's not overcomplicate them. The second and final point I want to make, perhaps the most important point, is that despite the very good trade deal that my government did uh, with the, the Beijing government, China weaponised trade against us as soon as Australia had the temerity to ask for a full, independent and impartial international investigation into the Wuhan virus. So while exporting Australian coal, Australian iron ore and Australian gas in massive quantities to China has certainly made us richer, it has also, we have to accept this, made China a superpower, and right now a very challenging superpower. So, if we want to avoid making our strategic challenges stronger, it's best to have freer trade with the countries that we know we can rely upon to be our friends. Thanks very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. A promise is a promise, uh, which all you will be here, back here with a panel, an interesting panel on, an, on a traditional, supposedly traditional topic, trade. This panel is going to show basically what Prime Minister Abbott said very clearly. Trade is about trade, it's about so much more. And that's what you're going to hear from, from us today. I'm going to go straight to our panelists because in, for the benefit of time. And I'm going to start with India's view of what happens to be a very hot topic in Europe today, which is a renewed, because we had long discussions which went nowhere, a renewed attempt to sign a free trade deal between India and Europe. So we're going to first hear the India's views, and then we're going to move to the European news, and then we're going to realize that the world is big out there, and that we're going to have Canada and South Korea to add to the conversation. So Sanjay, the floor is yours. Uh, as I was preparing for my intervention, I came across these numbers, and this was out of Ungtad, that uh, the global trade uh, last year uh, in goods was uh, one, uh, $25 trillion and uh, in services seven. And uh, what surprised me, shouldn't have, was that uh, last year India uh, crossed $1 trillion uh, in, in trade in goods and about $450 billion in services. Uh, so in that sense, we are part of a larger frame. And uh, we are so because uh, the growth in India uh, if you look at uh, our economic numbers from 91, it took us uh, almost uh, 31 years uh, to reach $3 trillion uh, in GDP, and it will probably take us seven and a half years only to make that into $6 uh, trillion. Uh, there is compounding growth in this country, and uh, our challenge is to uh, draw global attention to it, uh, uh, to Europe and elsewhere. Uh, 
India Europe relations are in a very good space. They are the strongest and deepest uh, they've ever been. Uh, the larger political relationship uh, is excellent. Uh, the traffic of uh, visitors, we have the German Chancellor, the Italian Prime Minister, and this continues. Uh, the state of play in the India-EU uh, FTA, including um, investments, is that uh, we've had three rounds. We're looking at the fourth round uh, uh, in about uh, 10 days' time. Uh, but just a flashback that uh, last time we had 16 rounds, which collapsed in 2013, uh, over a period of almost 10 years. But here, within, within a year, we've had three rounds and the fourth one uh, next week. The challenge is that while Europe is looking only at uh, uh, entry for their products, for us, it's a, it's a higher hurdle in meeting uh, standards and uh, meeting uh, criteria of sustainability, gender, labor, public procurement, etc. We want to get there. We want to get there because we are a responsible power, we are a modern economy, but we may need time. Uh, any suggestions that the trade uh, equation is not doing too well are probably negotiating uh, stances. We are confident uh, that we will reach uh, 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 an agreement uh, sooner than later. I'll rest my comments here. Uh, thank you, Secretary. And I call you Sanjay because I feel that by now we agree on so many things. And I think the most important point for me was to remind us, we Europeans, that it is quite complex, isn't it? All, those, all these standards, all these complexities, all of these large agreements that have become even larger because of um, climate change uh, expectations and, and as, as Prime Minister Abbott said, a lot of things in a trade agreement. Um, so. Because of that, I want to give the floor to our European panelists to whether agree or disagree on that idea that, yes, it is great, we have great relations, but it is hard. Um, I'm going to start with Andreas Scheuer, uh, and you know, you come from the largest economy in Europe, so I'm sure you have a say, and the, the biggest trading nation uh, for your size, and, and I just have to ask you, would you agree that we are, our trade deals are too complex? Thank you, Alicia, um, distinguished guest, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, let me say, uh, first of all, uh, we have a new order, a new time, and it's a time for new partnerships. Because uh, after the Russian's aggression and the uh, war in Ukraine, this is uh, for all of us a wake-up call to settle uh, make a new settlement. And um, I think um, our strategy, uh, Tony has uh, mentioned it, um, is um, a change through trade. It's a strategic point to make trade agreements. This is first priority. And um, in India, I would say it's fitting together made in Germany and make in India. Uh, but um, I have a few for um, the whole um, Asian region. Um, as a president of the Asia Bridge, we have um, so many countries. They are very dynamic. And um, Alicia, you are right to say um, our discussion about uh, FTAs in uh, the EU is, well, this, the, standard, uh, the standards and the discussion is so hard. Um, and um, to, to bring the highest standards uh, in the discussion, um, this is the wrong way. Uh, to have the agreements with a, a um, simple entry to a partnership, uh, this is uh, most important. And the Asia-Pacific region is a... Um, of high importance um, for the world order um, of the 21st century. And um, uh, let me say, Germany by itself, it's uh, the fourth largest economy. India is the fifth largest economy. India is growing, a hard competition. <laughs> um, most likely it will be the fourth biggest um, economy soon, but the trade balance is quite low. In um, 
2022, about uh, 25 billion US dollar uh, was the trade balance uh, of India and uh, Germany. With China, uh, it was 320 billion um, US dollar, um, 12 to uh, 30 times more. And uh, this is our effort to, uh, to improve that. And um, why the EU is India's third largest trading partner, India is only the EU's 10th uh, largest. Um, as for Germany, India ranks um, 23rd in terms of Germany imports and only uh, 26th um, as an import market. And this is now our um, effort to improve this. And um, I'm positive uh, for this. But you're right, the wrong discussion about the highest standard, standards in the EU, this is our problem. And, uh, we have to, to pivot um, this, um, uh, this discussion in the, in the EU. Wonderful. Uh, there's nothing better than realizing uh, what we need to do. And we're going to go back now to the business, the European business, um, uh, through Anna Stellinger, uh, because she's so well-placed to do this. Um, she represents... Uh, the, the, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprises, but, you know, Sweden is a major export power as well for its size. And, and I think there's nobody, else, nobody better placed because you've written a wonderful report on India-Europe trade and what a deal could mean for us, um, together with our last speaker, um, Nicola uh, Kolo Suzuki, uh, Institute Montagne and our host, ORF. So I'm going to give you the floor to talk about the business perspective of this potential deal. Thank you, Alicia. And yes, I'm very happy to be the voice of business uh, on this panel. My organization represents both big multinationals like IKEA, H&M and Ericsson, but also small ones like those who are going to be the Skype of tomorrow, for instance. I would like to make three points. I think the first point has been abundantly clear here during those days of the Raisina dialogue. It's that we are currently living in a world of turbulence and disorder. The last time we negotiated a free trade agreement between India and EU, that was between 2006 and 2013 when the negotiations were called off, we lived in a different world. That was 10 years ago. Today we have a world of turbulence, disorder, high inflation, high energy prices, lack of inputs, lack of semiconductors, broken value chains, a very, very challenged multilateral trading system, and the list could be much longer. And in this world of disorder, companies, countries, businesses need to adapt. But it is no time to turn inwards. It's no time for disengagement. No country, no business, no company can succeed alone. So as much as it is a time of disorder, it is also a time for cooperation. And my second point is that in this world of disorder, we talk sometimes about diversification. Diversification today, from a business perspective, is not just something that is, we're talking about. It's not an option, it is a must. Let me give you a few examples, because when we talk about diversification, and we hear this very clearly from all our companies, the big ones and the small ones, that we cannot put all the eggs in the same basket. And when I say basket here, I of course primarily think about China. Let me just give you a few examples on Europe's huge dependency on China, and put that in relation to EU, India. The EU exports 30 times the amount of cars from, from, um, from China, uh, to China than to India. 30 times as many cars, uh, nine times as much electrical machinery, 15 times the amount of pharmaceutical, 30 times as much as beverages, and I can go on and on and on. Now, that might not be of much interest to India, but if we look the other way around, EU's exports to, uh, India's exports to EU uh, the figures are even more asymmetric. 
China stands for 22% of all the imported goods in the EU. India stands for 2%. 2%. When it comes, for example, for some goods like toys, 77% come from China, 1% from India. And we have the same figures when it comes to furniture and clothing, where India should have a comparative advantage. This is worrying. When we look at advanced products, China is 50 times more important than India in the EU, like electrical mach machinery. Same goes for services, except for ICT, of course. Now, we asked our companies, the big ones and the small ones, during those years of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, what happens to your supply chains and what are you planning to do? Now, what they are saying, more than 40% of them, 43 to be exact, are saying that we need to be less dependent on China. We need to diversify. We need to have more countries around the world to trade with. And here, of course, the EU, India, free trade agreements is of huge importance. There's a fantastic untapped potential when it comes to trade between the EU and India. And that brings me to my last point. Because there are challenges and there are opportunities when it comes to negotiating a free trade agreement between EU and India. The, I mean, given the size of our economies, we should trade more. We should invest more. That is a no-brainer. And the EU is a relatively wealthy and diversified market that Indian companies would gain a lot to tap into. And of course, having a tariff-free access to Europe would be hugely beneficial to India and Indian companies. As you know, Bangladesh and Vietnam already have access, uh, tariff-free access to the EU market. India doesn't. And for Europe, of course, it would be hugely beneficial. I will not make the traditional list, the European list of complaints when it comes to trading with India. I'm sure you know them. We often complain about India being protectionist, about how difficult market access is for goods and for services. And then we talk about all those behind the border problems that we keep seeing in India. But the potential is huge. One more reason why we need to trade, need a trade agreement, negotiate a good free trade agreement between India and EU, is because if we do nothing, we will actually go in reverse. What do I mean by that? We have political engagement and political well, policies in both India and the EU that, was, that would pull us apart. In India, we have policies for self-reliance. Self-reliance is the opposite of free trade. And in EU, we have a lot of instruments, unilateral trade instruments, that will make trade with the EU more difficult for India. We have the CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, procure Procurement Instrument, the IPI, the due diligence legislation that will make it harder and more costly for Indian companies to join the EU market. So for all those reasons, the EU and India need an ambitious free trade agreement not just to remove the existing barriers, because there are many, but also to prevent new barriers to come. And we also need a good agreement that is mutually beneficial. It would open a huge growing market to the European com companies, because you do have growth in India. We are slightly moving backwards in my country, Sweden. But it would also open a tariff-free access to the European market where we have a lot of goods and services that India needs for the green transition. So, finally, if India is to conclude a free trade agreement with Europe, it would send a signal to the rest of the world that India is actually open for business and is a very reliable partner. I think that would also give us some predictability and that is exactly what we need at a time of turbulence and disorder. Thank you, and I think if anybody is not convinced, please raise your hand. But I think you are. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, but I, I want to go back to one uh, point you made, uh, which is very important. The one and only positive thing I can think of of uh, dealing with such high standards that Andreas and I were a little bit you know, criticizing, or at least not to the point that we see today, is that if you get there, you get anywhere, mm. which is exactly what you, you pointed out, that if India manages to get this agreement, or we manage to get an agreement with, with you, 
That shows the predictability of policies where China is heading. A lot of what the EU does is actually WTO enhancing. It's not only for the EU, it's for the world. So I think this is a very important message. And finally, all of the reasons you gave for Europe is not only about the Indian market, let's face it. Mm -hmm. You gave some numbers, I'm going to give you one more number, which is as scary, if not more. 89% of European solar panels come from China. So we have a sourcing problem, not only a market problem. We need to find somewhere else to produce these solar panels. Give me mm -hmm. a better place. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So this is basically why we're here today, but it's not only about India and Europe. We have here Canada and South Korea with probably similar problems, and we've not even talked about the Inflation Reduction Act, <laughs> the elephant in the, group, in, in the room. So I'm going to leave the, the floor to Scott Moe's Premier of the Government of Sankach. Chefson, which I can't pronounce, which is very sad, but I'm sure he can do that better than me. And the floor is yours on Canada's view on trade. Well, I, I would very quickly invite you for a visit, and we would take a week to uh, teach you how to pronounce uh, <laughs> the, you. the province of Saskatchewan, <laughs> and, and extend that to, to all on, on stage and, and, and in the room. And I'll maybe take a little bit of a, a different perspective on trade and, and how we build towards free trade agreements from the, from the subnational level. The subnational level, obviously, I'm, I'm a leader in, in a province of Saskatchewan. We don't sign a national, nation to nation of free trade agreements as a, as a subnational leader, but there's certainly work that, that that can happen at the subnational level that I think, in fairness, liaisons between uh, some of the needs and, and desires and, and ambitions of business um, and brings those, uh, br brings those more regionalistic priorities uh, to our federal governments, uh, to other nations as well, uh, but to our federal governments so that they can be addressed ultimately and quite often and all too often at a later date in a, in a, uh, in a free trade agreement. And I think so the first question that I uh, think we could all ask ourselves is, you know, why do we trade in the first place? What's, what's our reasoning behind uh, even looking towards a free trade agreement? And I think it's, it's to build resiliency in, uh, in, in our case, in our quest to uh, provide ultimately food security and energy security to the people that we collectively represent in our respective nations around the world. Now, it's much more complex than that, and there will be other speakers that will uh, speak to those complexities. I will keep it at a, at a very high, um, somewhat um, a public policy level on how do we actually achieve uh, what we want to achieve when we when we trade, and so what is the subnational role in that? And I'll, I'll speak to Saskatchewan's role in this. First of all, um, we focus on the products that are are important to our province. We're we're not a large province uh, by population. We're 1.2 million people, but we are a large province by geography. We have, for example, 40 percent of Canada's Canada's arable agricultural land. Um, we are uh, the largest producer in the world when it comes to canola, when it comes to wheat, when it comes to mustard. Um, the largest imports, uh, sorry, um, pardon me, in India, we are the largest uh, exporter for us. The largest number of imports uh, when it comes to lentils come from Saskatchewan. Uh, the largest amount of potash coming into India comes uh, from the province of Saskatchewan. We produce uranium, uh, provide that in years uh, past to India. We provide uh, uranium for clean nuclear power to the European Union, to various countries as well as, as other countries around the world. And so we are um, somewhat specialists uh, in advocating for the products that are uh, being produced in our, in our province, agriculture, food, fuel and fertilizer ultimately that we provide uh, to over 150 countries around the world. Um, we're specialists in that. Um, there's other areas uh, in Canada that will have auto manufacturing uh, plants, uh, jet manufacturing facilities. They're specialists in that area, but very much in Saskatchewan, we know the products that employ people that provide us uh, for our, our, an opportunity to achieve our, our growth agenda in our province. Um, second is uh, we're also a specialist in working with the business community, the industries, on where the potential markets are. Where, where in the world are they looking for uh, those, those trade agreements ultimately at the end of the day, but where in the world do they want to go start trading uh, today? And, and we have been advocates for exactly those industries at the subnational level, for example, um, we, we've been in India all week with a delegation, with myself as the leader of, of, uh, of, of Saskatchewan. Last week, our agricultural minister was in, was in India for a week. Next, uh, next week, we have a, 
uh, a tech delegation that's here. We have an open provincial uh, office that uh, can liaison Saskatchewan businesses into the opportunities that are uh, that are in India. We have nine of those that are operating around the world. We have uh, one in Germany servicing the EU, UK, uh, Japan, all, all over. Um, but they're in markets that are most certainly of, of interest to, to our province. Um, uh, that all of that work happens in support of, in the case of India, our our, our national office, which is the the high commission, uh, the high commission here in India, which our high commissioner uh, Cameron McKay is here today. Welcome, Cameron. Um, and we work very closely together uh, with our national government uh, on that. Three, this this dialogue starts the collaboration that then ultimately can become a free trade agreement. Uh, that the the business dialogue, the subnational dialogue, ultimately adds into uh, the the uh, the wording and the dialogue that is necessary for a a national uh, nation to nation or multi nation. A free trade agreement to actually uh, to actually occur, occur, and then with that dialogue comes uh, the answers to a number of questions. And, and I would say those questions are more easily answered when those relationships are already years uh, into uh, in, into play. Of uh, you know how ethically are, are those products produced? How, from a sustainability perspective, um, are those products produced that are coming into our uh, into our nation? And 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 that is what we are already uh, to the point in. A point of uh, with our uh, trade offices, with our engagement of, uh, you know, again, 1.2 million people with over 150 countries around the world is, you know, how are you producing your agricultural products? Well, the fact of the matter is in Saskatchewan, our, our canola and wheat products, our oil seeds and, and grain products are, are produced with a 60% lower carbon content than, than the next uh, uh, seven major uh, competitors around the world. Our potash, for example, half the carbon content on a per ton basis than our uh, competitors around the world in providing uranium uh, for clean nuclear power to many of our allied uh, friends, allied nations around the world, uh, to uh, quote uh, uh, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott's comments. Um, it's a great story uh, for us to tell, and it's a great opportunity for us to engage at the subnational level, supporting the businesses that are creating wealth and health in, in our province, um, but ultimately building towards uh, and in support of those broader free trade agreements that then, that then can happen. And so that trade, I guess, would my point, my point would be is that trade can start happening long before you have a free trade agreement. We always focus in on, on broad free trade agreements, um, whether they're nation to nation or multi-nation, and we're involved uh, as, an, as, as a nation of Canada in all of those, and we're in support uh, most certainly of all of those as an exporting as an exporting province. But much of that work can happen long before uh, at the subnational level, and I would say that it, it really should happen uh, long before. Um, there's, there's rewards to it. We do about 20% of the, the product <laughs> exports from Canada that go, uh, come into India, come from our province of Saskatchewan. Uh, we very much focus on a number of, a number of countries, but we do focus on, on India and 20% of the goods coming out of Canada into India come from our province. Um, once a free trade agreement comes around, what, what, what does that opportunity become? When CETA was signed and ratified in, in Canada, um, we've actually increased our trade with the European nation by 190% since that happened. And so it starts with a substantial volume of exports from our perspective, imports from India's perspective, ends with uh, much, much more. And so that is the goal. It's freer trade. It's freer trade with our allies, as uh, was, was set out in the, in the beginning. And I think the subnational role in this is very important in the development of ultimate free trade agreements that we all aspire to. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yes, mm, uh, but, but we, we should learn about how to roadshow. And I have to say something about this. This is amazing for a very simple reason, because we're talking about trade being politicized at the highest level. Yeah? And the thing is that it can go very low, deep into provinces, people, and we should force our politicians to trade. Sorry, Andreas, <laughs> I know you've been a politician, but I'm sure you agree. I mean, the, the point is, it is powerful to see trade coming from the grassroots and pushing it up and obliging our pro politicians to sign our deal, you India deal, and many other deals. And, and I think that's a very important message that you've passed on. But there's no time, literally no time, uh, so I'm going to ask Hyun Chun Kim, the president of the Korean Institute for International Economic 
policy to give us actually a very different view. Since this is so complex, he has the solution. He oh. really does. <laughs> he really has the solution to make these free trade deals easier. So we're all ears. Okay, thank you very much, Alicia, for the, uh, the uh, too much <laughs> strong I mean, request. And uh, thank you for having me and this Rezina uh, dialogue. Uh, it's my second time uh, to participate in this forum. Very, uh, in, very informative and also very insightful. And thank you again for the, the, uh, this, actually this time, uh, because the, the today, uh, this year, the Korea and the India uh, celebrate the 50 years of the diplomatic relations. And, and also, uh, we are pursuing the Korea-India uh, SEPA, a Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, about uh, 14 years of the, uh, the, the, this trade pact. But, uh, but I want to talk about the, the, the trade pact. So we are now in a, a stage of the, uh, the multiple crisis. And then yeah, for the for two decades, we talked about the too much, so many times about the FTA. And uh, if you, you know that uh, after, since the, uh, the financial, global financial crisis, the, the increase of the trade volume has just, has just um, stagnated. Uh, while they, uh, you know, you have, um, the, we can observe the more conflict, uh, not only in the security, traditional conventional security, but also economic security uh, area as well. So what is the, the usefulness of the FTA? So I think that we need to uh, elaborate the, some more uh, diverse uh, types of the FTA we need to uh, develop. Uh, for instance, I mean, uh, we can ma maybe the, the develop the, some more uh, the, uh, trade pact, uh, something like the uh, trade investment promotion uh, for, uh, effect uh, framework, uh, which is that uh, not without pushing too much on the uh, market opening or market access, uh, then we can include the, uh, the many new uh, agendas and new issues. The reason why they are now the digital, uh, trade, digital trade pact is so now that's growing uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, in the Pacific areas, like the uh, DEPA or the US, uh, US Japan and uh, digital uh, economic uh, pact and many others. The reason is that, um, well, uh, you can add up the just time I mean, digital chapter in the existing FTA. But if you just I mean, sit on the table and that they're renewing the, the, your the existing FTA, there are too many agendas just I mean, uh, come in. So that's the reason why the, we, we are now the pursuing the separate the digital chapter, separate the digital pact, the separate the environmental pact, and the, et cetera, et cetera, and then something like this. So uh, that's the reason why the, the, we are now the, uh, pursuing this kind of thing. So I think that the, we uh, need to have a, some more a lighter form of the, uh, the FTA uh, form. Uh, not only just I mean the, just just the, uh, the, the, the bilateral things, uh, but also the minilateral or regional uh, uh, things, something like that. And so uh, that is uh, uh, one idea. And uh, the other is that of course uh, we need to add up some more new issues like the digital and then green and uh, environmental and also supply chain uh, the uh, issues as well. And uh, so in that case, I mean, you can, we can uh, develop the, some uh, other types of the, uh, the uh, trade, the trade pact. This, this is also uh, related to trade. So we can, we can call it the trade pact. And so uh, when it comes to the, uh, the environment, uh, you know, now that there is growing tension uh, between uh, trade rule, multilateral trade rules and then multilateral environmental agreement, because um, so many governments are now pushing uh, the, the spending the, a lot of money, I mean, on the, the subsidizing, you know, the, the renewables and in, industries. And in many cases, it can violate the, uh, the existing trade rules of the non-discrimination and also uh, subsidy uh, rule as well. So we need to talk about these issues. So, so still, again, we need to back to the, the multilateral uh, uh, talk in Geneva. So... We need to talk about uh, these issues in WTO. And the Ministerial Conference M13, MC13, uh, will be uh, uh, scheduled now the early uh, next year. So we need to add up the, this, this uh, environmental issue, and we need to add up the, some more the digital issue, but um, not the old kind of the digital issue, but, but uh, digital trade issue. Uh, digital trade issue is also huge, uh, but uh, we can uh, just I mean, focus on the, uh, some uh, aspect of the digital, uh, digital trade issues, uh, such as the, uh, you know, uh, computing, the location of the computing uh, facilities, and also uh, data 
uh, cross of data as a price something like that. So uh, that is the, the, the uh, so uh, what I'm saying is that um, now, uh, all, almost everybody thinks that um, now the, the Geneva, I mean, w, WTO is now just almost forgotten. Everybody is talking about WTO reform, but they just I mean, forget the, uh, the what's going on now, what should be going, going on in WTO. But uh, still, WTO is very important and very useful, I mean, you know, tool uh, for talking about the, uh, the many solutions are now in, under the, uh, the, this multiple crisis. So let me remind the, uh, you of the, uh, the use place of the WTO again, and also uh, minilateral and the bilateral uh, uh, initiatives for the, uh, the, the slightly different types of the many uh, differentiated trade pact is still uh, useful uh, to pursue. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is the recipe, and Andreas, give me a sec. I know you want to jump, but the recipe seems to be, I think it's a great idea, Keep on going to Geneva, but at the same time do something and don't do it so complicated. Don't do this big free trade agreement with everything on it. Dice it up, dice it, and, and get to what you need most urgently. And I'm sure we all can think of critical materials as a very urgent thing that South Korea has been working massively with specific agreements. So I think we have a lot to learn uh, from this experience. And I have 12 minutes, Andreas wants to speak, I have a, a final speaker, and I have all of this room probably with wonderful questions to ask. So, Andreas, please. So, uh, we'll do a quick round. So, it's going to be uh, Andreas and, and Sanjay, and then we're going to have um, uh, Nicola. Yeah. So it's quite this was a joke uh, with the roadshow and the Canadians roadshow here uh, in India. Um, um, my first point is um, we uh, should have a look for all. Um, the Asian countries. Uh, sorry for that, but um, uh, as a president of the Asia Bridge, we have uh, 15 countries from India to Australia, and um, um, we had yesterday the panel with uh, the Beatles combo, quad, is um, uh, also very important um, to have here a, a closer uh, partnership on co uh, cooperation between EU and uh, quad, for example, but I'm not negative or the either or uh, discussion, uh, uh, China, yes or not. Um, if we have our powerhouse, uh, our power, our strength uh, on the democratic market, we have 60% um, of the worldwide GDP and uh, China only 20%. And I think we should uh, use uh, this, um, uh, this um, uh, 60%. We are here with a huge delegation from Germany. My colleague from the uh, Deutsche Bundestag, Peter Bayer, is here. Uh, we have a cooperation with uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And we uh, have a look for all other countries because we have a chance to, to change the world for a better democratic system and a democratic market. And um, let, let me say, uh, let me mention, our problem is speed for the trade agreements and also the public debate, the media debate in the national situation. And w we must um, catch the people and um, um, uh, have arguments for the positive sides of the treaty uh, uh, agreements because the public debate, for example, in Germany or Europe, is absolutely negative. Oh, and uh, after the aggression, Russian aggression, we have a new chance to turn it to a positive way, and we should do it. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, I'm going to give a minute, a minute, a minute, because we're waiting for Nicola. Yeah. I will go quickly. First of all, I would like to disagree on the free trade agreements. I don't think we should do quick and dirty. I don't think we should do shallow. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we should do piece by piece. Because if we look what trade is today, it's also about data flows. It's about digitalization. It's about services. It's about moving people. And it's about sustainability. So if we want to cover trade the way trade actually looks, we need it to be ambitious. So I would disagree. <clears throat> but Thank if you. we love free trade agreements... We love the WTO even more. Yeah. From a business perspective, having the same rules, even small advances in WTO, having the same rules in 164 countries around the world is 
always more efficient from a business perspective than looking country by country. And then finally, I would not do my job if I didn't say how happy we are to work with Nicola of Institut Jacques Delors, with Samir from ORF, and my colleague Henrik here has made a leaflet on your tables where you can see uh, the trade and the benefits between EU and India. So thanks to these three excellent gentlemen. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm going to take off my European hat and put a Latin American hat. Anybody here from 20 years Mercosur? That's all I have to say. So we can be comprehensive, but we should be quick. We should be quick. Mercosur is a uh, different ball game. Uh, I'm just leaving. I leave it there. Uh, Sanjay. I think I was far too courteous at keeping my opening remarks brief, uh, but I guess that's life. A <laughs> uh, few quick, quick, quick points. Uh, one, we are not discouraged by the numbers coming out of India in terms of international trade because there's just the beginning. Uh, growth has been largely consumption-led and infrastructure spending. That is changing. Uh, secondly, I'm reminded of the fact that in Adam Smith's book on uh, creation of wealth, the uh, term uh, invisible hand appears probably only once because it is a myth There is uh, that there is an invisible hand and uh, rational uh, 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 dictates uh, uh, trading and economic relationship. It doesn't. Uh, you need enabling political environment. The little I remember from my university days is that uh, the early economic growth in the uh, Asian Tigers uh, was uh, incubated by uh, special trading relationships uh, with the West. The world gave China a pass for three decades, an absolute pass, and that is where uh, they drew their dividend from. Uh, with respect to us, I think uh, we are not distracted uh, uh, the larger leadership by what is happening in Ukraine or the occasional uh, irritating uh, isolated incidents which tend to grab TV screens and uh, sort of uh, camouflage the larger economic growth and development which is taking place in India. Thankfully, that is not happening. If you've been following the news that in the last few weeks, India has announced buying a thousand aircrafts, which suggests that we want to reach out to the world, we want to connect. We have over a, a million and a half uh, Indian students, quality students. Our population is going to be young for the next four decades. Uh, we will be producing qualified, well-educated people. The world will have to be ready to receive a lot of Indians in several places, in several platforms, occasionally for executive guidance in, in, in countries. Uh, and that is not going to change. Uh, so migration and mobility has to be part of trade deals. Uh, the digital aspect, we are we are more than ready because our digital public infrastructure is uh, giving out uh, uh, unimaginable uh, positive gains all around, which we also want to share with the Global South. So I will rest my uh, case here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. I won't make any single comment because I need to have Nicola um, for five minutes. So, so Alicia, you've given me the easy task of wrapping up uh, the loose <laughs> ends of this panel. Um, and let me have a stab at that. So one thing that really strikes me here is that all the countries represented on this panel here are very highly dependent on international trade. We have Korea, where the trade to GDP ratio is 80%. Canada, 61%. India, 46%. And in the EU, it's 43%, and in Australia, 40%. And this is actually in very stark contrast to the United States, which has a trade dependency ratio of only 26%. So the US, of course, has in recent years not only tried to decouple its economy from the Chinese economy, but it has also embarked uh, it has also not engaged in any new trade agreements. This is a trend that started under Trump, but it has continued under the Biden administration. Now, while the U.S. is looking inward, the other countries represented on this panel still depend on trade as an engine for growth and prosperity. They need a rules-based system for trade and investment that offer their firms a degree of certainty when uh, operating beyond their own home markets. But, as we have heard, there are some negative externalities of economic integration, such as the outsourcing 
of um, the stricter environmental standards that we need to tackle climate change, and also the weaponization of um, economic interdependence that some countries use to achieve foreign policy objectives. Many countries have therefore concluded that they need to address these negative external effects of trade and de-risk their economic relations with other countries. But the problem is that international politics move at a much faster pace than the trade and investment decisions of firms. So government may make strategic decisions and set incentives for the future, but it takes many years for firms to adapt to new value chain realities. So the Jacques Delors Institute and uh, the Observer Research Foundation um, are writing um, a study for the Swedish Confederation of, um, of Enterprise, which we'll be publishing in the coming weeks. Um, and we are looking at this question, how the EU and India can play a role in de-risking global value chains. We find that there is indeed a lot of potential in this relationship, but that the current trajectory is just not enough to de-risk international trade. As we have heard from Anna, um, India's share in the European Union's import basket has hovered around 2%, while um, India's, uh, the European Union imports from China are 10 times as large, and the share in the European import basket actually has continued to grow over the last decade. European companies are amongst the most important investors in India, but they have also become less important over the last decade compared to investors from other economies. And one key problem is that European companies in India are mostly producing for consumption in the Indian market. So if India wants to be serious about replacing China as a global manufacturing hub, it has to lower tariffs for intermediate goods and also work much harder to improve its um, transportation systems so that it can become competitive with countries in Southeast Asia. If this does not happen fast enough, there is a risk uh, for India that other countries will become the greatest beneficiaries of the reshuffling of value chains that is beginning to take place right now. Now, if the EU and India want to change the trajectory they are currently on, they must find a new framework for their economic relations. And that begins with concluding the negotiations for trade and investment agreements that started last, restarted last year after being dormant for almost a decade. But the market access that the European Union seeks goes beyond what India has offered in any other trade agreement. And it would require a very fundamental shift in the Indian, in in the Indian government's current industrial and uh, procurement policies. On the other hand, as we've heard uh, from multiple speakers here, um, there has been a shift in the institutional setup in the European Union. In the 2009 Lisbon Treaty, EU trade policy must align with the European Union's wider pol political objectives, and the European Parliament has gotten co-decision power, so that means it can vo veto any trade agreement that is tabled. And this has given a much greater voice to European civil society, which means that labor and environmental standards are an important part of the EU trade agenda now. The problem is there is a perception gap, um, and in India, sustainable development standards are seen either as a form of hidden protectionism, or as a form of neocolonialism. So while India has to think deeply about its industrial policy and procurement frameworks, the EU will also have to do much better to communicate its sustainable development policies to Indian policymakers and find new constructive ways to work together um, with Indian policymakers in Indian society to build trust. For example, the EU could accelerate technology transfer for uh, cleaner production methods of steel and aluminum and offer more climate financing to offset some of the negative impacts that its environmental trade policy objectives will certainly have for Indian exports. 
The new EU India Trade and Technology Council that was launched last year could also complement these trade negotiations. In this council, the EU and India now have structured discussions around strategic technologies, such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing and semiconductors, green technologies like clean energy, and resilient value chains, such as access to critical components and raw materials. But if the EU and India want to reconfigure global value chains in the coming years, this will just not be enough. Without a binding new trade and investment framework, the economic relationship between the EU and India will just not reach its full potential and, uh, the, and reconfigure global value chains so that India can become a global manufacturing hub that replaces the role of China. Now, if the leadership in Delhi and Brussels realizes this, um, I do certainly hope that this will encourage the two sides to come together and finally make the EU-India trade agreement a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, it says time is up, but I was also promised to uh, be here until 10 to, 10 to 3, which means we can have two questions. I think there's like, oh my God, so many hands. So, uh, mm, please, the floor is yours. There's two hands there, there's a lady here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Patrick Kugel, Polish Institute of International Affairs. I have a question to Minister Verma. A very simple and obvious question. Uh, actually, when the uh, FTA negotiations were relaunched last year, there was a very ambitious deadline and goal set up, uh, which means that uh, they need to be finished, uh, concluded until the end of 2023, which means we have still uh, 10 months to, to, <laughs> to meet the deadline. So the question is, uh, how hopeful you are that you can meet the deadline and uh, uh, conclude the negotiations by the end of this year? And what needs to be done or what needs uh, need to happen uh, to allow you to conclude the negotiations? And also, what would be the future of the uh, negotiations given that both India and the European Union will enter uh, election year uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the very important question. Time is up also for the negotiations. So, second question. Uh, yes, please. I'm Dominique uh, from Ivory Coast and uh, based in Ghana. We know that Ghana and Ivory Coast together are producing more than 50% 50, 50 of the cocoa consumed worldwide. But sadly, I eat Ferrero Rocher and Lindt. There is no local chocolate in Ivory Coast. Fact two. In my field of work, North American vehicles are representing more than 70% of the used car population in Nigeria and Ghana. But to repair those cars, we cannot have access to the data due to US export regulations. Shouldn't we talk about fairness, consistency, when it comes to dealing with Africa? One more question. Over there, yeah. Yes, and these two ladies, and that's all I could see. My name is Matthew Sada, University of Southern California. I want to ask about, uh, at the Center on Public Diplomacy, and I want to ask about public support for trade, because most of you on the dais right now are trade proponents, but we also know that there's a lot of skepticism about it. I want to ask about the language that's used for trade. If you mention trade, it probably has a negative reaction, most of the population, but if you talk about securing the supply chain, securing access to resources, ally and partner reliance, what can we do with the language yeah to use, that we use for trade to get more support. Okay. Hi, I'm Tanya. I represent the United Nations Hult Prize Accelerator, so a lot of the UN SDGs based startup ideas, and I also work with KMG, KPMG for the TMT vertical globally. My question is directed to Anna, and uh, also taking from what Sanjay said about the demographic dividend of India. If I look at the industries that you've specifically mentioned in this report, and given that we split it across four decades of skill building, which leads then to also reverse exports into EU when the technology transfer is done, I would like you to help us understand how that plan could be actioned. And that's the question. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, lady there, please. 
Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Swasti Rao from the MPIDS, and I work on the Europe and Eurasia Center. So I follow these uh, developments very closely. I have a very brief question, and especially to our friend from Germany, which is that uh, the EU-China trade and investment deal has been stuck over human rights issues, and uh, lately we saw that those human rights uh, talks have been resumed. So how do you see that development happening? Uh, we in India track that very closely as to what your relationship, and especially the economic relationship with China is going in and what direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. There is a gentleman, uh, yes. Uh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I shall Priyadarshi from uh, RIS New Delhi. I have a straight question to uh, Madam Speaker from Sweden. You know, you presented the numbers which are quite exciting for the, the crowd here. Uh, which, which implies that European consumers liked Chinese goods for years. It, it says that Chinese goods are probably high quality. It maintains all environmental sustainability norms, human rights conditions, labor standards. That's why Europe continues to import from China so much. Now, if that is the case, then why not other countries could come in? So is it the motivation for you to go for low price, which Chinese good happen to be, or it is Chinese goods are high quality goods that you demand in any, any of the pre-trade agreements that you are negotiating? Uh, well, uh, uh, the timeline on the FTA India EU, let me say that uh, the uh, political leadership uh, uh, sees three great advantages in this. One is, of course, the size of the Indian market, the demographics, two, uh, that we as a major energy consumer are uh, 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 part of the climate change uh, debate and how we transition and three because of a geostrategic location uh, pivotably placed in the Indian Ocean and being a net security pro provider and a first responder. I think all these uh, together are, are great cases that uh, the political leadership uh, will try and uh, push this ahead. Uh, we will have to get the bureaucracies on both sides and uh, a limited interest in business to also look at this to uh, hasten the process. Uh, uh, as a bureaucrat, uh, I, I can admit that sometimes we feel that the sun, like the rooster in the morning, that the sun rises uh, because you are, you have sort of uh, uh, awakened in it. Uh, but uh, we will be guided by political uh, directions here, and we are hopeful that in the timeline indicated, we will reach uh, a favorable and mutually acceptable agreement. Thank you. Um who wants to take Andreas? There was a question uh, addressed to Anna and Andreas, at least that directly, yeah. Yes, but I need to comment on the one on the language about the non-support, public support on trade, because my country, Sweden, is the country in Europe where we love trade. The public opinion for trade is sky high. It actually is a huge exception. And I would just like to say a word about that, because we do, we, we single your, out. You, you choose your Trade answer. unions are hugely positive. Businesses are hugely positive. All political parties are hugely positive because we have explained it for many generations. Sweden is a small country. We would be eating potatoes without trade. Trade with the rest of the world makes us more wealthy. And with this wealth, we pay for a, a top of the line welfare system. We have parental leave, schools, we have a system with good health care, we take care of our infrastructure, so it's what you do with the money that actually gives the support to trade. So for Sweden, trade equals welfare. Thank you, and I know there's a question you'll have offline because we don't have time. Andreas, there was a question for you right there on human rights and trading with China. I'm sorry, it was there. Yeah, but um, the partnership to China um, is for all. Yeah, um, I know. It's for uh, everybody. Sorry for that, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I said um, it's not a discussion either or. Uh, we need the China's market. And yes, um, I, I was uh, the former um, Minister for Transport and uh, Digital Infrastructure in Germany, and uh, I wa was twice in the cabinet of Angela Merkel, and uh, he uh, he had, uh, she, uh, she had um, all the negotiations with China with the human, right, human rights um, uh, discussion. Yes, we should um, make it together. Yeah? Um, and um, um, we, we should um, mention the problems, but also the partnership. 
Thank you. I'm sorry that I can't give you the floor. You want a floor? Yeah. Okay. Very, very briefly. Very briefly. Yeah. I, 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 I try to answer to the professor from sure. USC. I mean, many countries, many people now, especially for the, the advanced uh, countries, if the government has proceeded some kind of the trade pact, which means that, um, that they just accept that, oh, yeah, government is now doing very foolish things uh, because a trade pact means job loss. Yeah, that was uh, the image, but that, that is a very wrong image because the, um, in many cases, uh, job loss and the widening income disparities uh, uh, due to the uh, technological progress and also uh, mal, mal, you know, the, the, the bad I mean, domestic politics. And, and that was the main reason, uh, but not the other trade. Uh, so we need to, uh, we, but we need to accept that this kind of the reality and that we need to pursue the, uh, the trade liberaliz liberalization uh, again, but we need to, uh, to develop the, uh, the other types of things as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to stop it right here before we're thrown out of this room. Thank you so much for your attention.